Greetings, it is I, Tantus Naraman Jacobin, Lord Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on Dungeons and Dragons, the fifth edition of it. The fifth edition of D&D. Well, let's dive in today because we were talking about unusual environments, and let's finish talking about them today. We started talking about sailing a ship on the high seas. Now, the fact is, when you're upon the seas, you can navigate similar to what you are on land. If you are close to land, where you can see land masses, various landmarks, you don't really have to make a check. You're not going to get lost. When you're out on the sea, on the other hand, you have to rely on the sun and the stars in order to navigate you, and you have to actually make some appropriate checks to see where you're going when you're out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. It is important to note that you can have sea surface based, sh sailing based encounters, random encounters, and you'll have just as much frequency for them as you, well, would have had on land. Now let's talk about weather. Well, Weather is just the same as all those charts I talked about back in the time where I was talking about it for all the other terrains. It works just the same at the ocean. There are some important things to note. If you've got heavy winds and heavy rain, well, guess what? You got a storm. A storm also then results in heavy waves. This can easily result in a crew losing sight of land and not knowing where they're at, unless there's some kind of bright light like a warehouse. So generally speaking, you're gonna get disadvantaged on any checks to navigate through a storm. Now, when there's no wind whatsoever, you're at dead calm. You can't sail by while well, sails. You can still row, and you can technically sail against the wind just at half speed that you normally would have. Now, on traditional bright sunny day upon the ocean, you can see really far away. If you're up in the crow's nest, you can see another ship or land up to 10 miles away. If it's overcast, you can see about half that distance, and of course, fog, rain, and all the such will reduce visibility just the same way as it does on land. So, by a lot. Now the fact is, along the adventure, your characters could get a ship. They could purchase a ship. They could capture one and take it over. Or a mission that's given to them or some kind of adventure, whoever is basically the patron of them, can give them a ship. The fact is that you as the game master control whether your players get a ship or not. There might be no one to sell it to them. The ship might be too damaged to basically take over. Whatever reason, you can easily set things up that they either get a ship or they don't. It's going to be entirely up to you. But once they have a ship, regardless of how they got it, they're going to need crew for it. Because guess what? Your characters alone are not going to crew most vessels. Now, most vessels will list the amount of crew that you are going to require. These will require skilled sailors. Hiring a skilled sailor costs you two gold pieces per day to have that skilled sailor aboard your ship working for you. And as I said, ship type will tell you the minimum number of sailors you're going to need to actually sail this vessel. There's an entire chart listing various types of both sea and land-based vehicles. Now, crew. It has a loyalty. We talked about loyalty before. You as the dungeon master can track the loyalty of the crew individually or as a group in the hull. It is important to note that if half the crew becomes disloyal, you're going to have a mutiny at your hand if you're at sea. If half the crew becomes disloyal and you manage to make it to berth, to basically dock, well, then that half the ship is probably going to leave the ship and not return. So basically, it's all bad if you manage to get your crew to be very disloyal. Now, your ship could have passengers. Each ship will list the amount of passengers they normally can have. Now, this isn't to say you couldn't adjust this slightly. This is assuming, basically, bunks like any other sailor would have, basically hammocks. Would you could charge someone about five silver pieces a day for a hammock? Individual rooms, you can charge them a lot more for. Two gold pieces a day for a day of travel for an individual room. Thing about individual rooms is, if you have them, you can have one-fifth as many individual rooms for passengers if, as then you would have had for hammocks. Basically, however many passengers you would have had before, divide it by five. That's your new number if you're doing individual rooms. Now a ship will have cargo. It's going to be measured in tons. A ship has a damage threshold. What does this mean? This is a number that as long as the damage dealt to your ship is less than this number, your ship takes no damage from that attack. So this is the amount of damage that it has to meet or beat this for your ship to take damage. 
It is very important to note that when your ship takes damage, it still takes the exact amount of damage being dealt. As long as it exceeds the threshold, your ship's just damaged by whatever amount it's taking. A ship can be repaired at a rate of one hit point per day of work per 20 gold pieces worth of labor and material purchase. So that's a pretty slow rate, but a ship can be repaired over time if it takes a lot of damage. Let's talk about flying, because guess what? You might fly places. There's creatures that fly, there's spells that allow you to fly, there's items that once worn or used will allow you to fly yourself. Flying can be just everyday part of adventure. You might have a flying mount you're traveling on. It is important to note that for flying mounts, for every three hours they travel, they must rest at least one hour. It is also important to note that about nine hours is the max amount of time a creature can fly before it really needs to rest. That's the amount of time it can go over land before it's got to land somewhere. You, for most things, at least for most people, and this is exception of this is of course magic items that are basically giving you the magic ability to fly because guess what, that's not going to tire you out whatsoever. That's an entirely different thing. <laughs> but if you're using wings, you're going to want to basically land at some point in time. Most creatures will, with some exceptions, usually listed under those specific creatures. Now, just like on land, you can have random encounters. You're going to have random encounters at the exact same rate as on land. There are some important exceptions because the random encounter charts you're going to use are the land below you. You can ignore any creature that you would have rolled for on the random encounters that doesn't fly. Unless your characters are particularly close to the ground basically within arm's reach almost, maybe. Now, there are also some other exceptions. Does the things that they are encountering have some kind of ranged attacks or magic that they could use at a range? Well, then they might engage, engage your character too. So there are options for engagements there. The advantage that your flying characters have is that they can either spot and avoid the encounter whatsoever, or very easily disengage from it by basically flying away they have much better chances of effectively avoiding and getting away from encounters than they would have if they were on land. Now, let's move on to a very important section, because next to creatures, there's one thing everywhere that you're going to encounter probably in any dungeon or any place you're exploring. Traps. They're all over the place. Traps cause you to fall to your death. They crush you, stab you, drown you. They do horrible things to your characters and end up in many of them being dead. Traps can either be mechanical or magical. A mechanical trap will either drop you down a pit, crush you, stab you, throw ar arrows into you, all of them with some kind of mechanical device activating it along the way. Magical traps, on the other hand, can either be specifically magic devices that are being activated or specific spells that can be used in trap format. Regardless, when it is activated, it will then mimic the effects of a spell. Effectively, the magical trap will cast a spell upon the targets of it, whether this is specifically the spell itself as trap form or the magic item that's effectively using the spell. Doesn't matter, you're getting spelled by this trap. But that's actually it for today. I first finished up with the unusual environments. I talked about sailing across the ocean and things you might need to know, including getting your own ship and what a lot of those ship statistics will mean. That, you know, you're going to have a crew, you're going to have passengers, you're going to have cargo, you're going to have to worry about your ship taking damage. Your ship is going to be important if you have a ship-based game. Or you can just be a passenger on one and call it a day. Both are options. Or you can also be a sailor, too. Can't forget that, that you're just a lowly member of the crew rather than the actual captain. Then we talked about traveling through the sky. Flying in some way. Where you can have a flying mount, which will need extra rest. Or you can definitely have just a creature that flies across the sky for nine hours straight, either you through magic or whatever. Again, you through magic, you could probably fly longer, but still. Then I began talking about traps. I went over the basics that there are two types of traps. Mechanical. Magical. In the next episode, we're going to dive deeper into traps, talking all about them, and then talk about some of the sample ones that are in the book. And hopefully, hopefully we'll start talking about, of course what you do in between your adventures. That's going to be an important one to talk about more on the Dungeon Master side rather than the player side at this point in time, but a little bit of both. But if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe at Shishpo for the channel, the empire, the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon. Link in the description below. There's some great rewards there. It helps to grow and improve the channel and empire. 
Regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.